chapter, Romans chapter 15. Okay? And so I'm going to go back to Romans 14. Mike. self-denial on behalf of others. I'm reading out of the NASB. <coughs> New American Standard. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so anyway, so chapter, uh, verse, uh, fifth, uh, chapter 15, verse 1 through uh, 3, I'm going to read. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to, him, to edif his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but, said it, that, but as it was written, the reproaches of those who, those who reproached you fell on me. And I, my, my interpretation of the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me were the sins of, of man that fell on Jesus. Is that correct? Okay, <laughs> so, um, Paul is continuing in that very vein of thought as he begins the 15th chapter, and here he puts the final touches on this subject. But chapter 15 is a continuation of this very subject of our treatment towards the differences within the body, and especially towards the weaker brothers. <coughs> um, I shouldn't just be thinking about myself. This is from uh, verses one through three. I shouldn't be just thinking about my own pleasures. I'm going to eat this prime rib. I don't care what he thinks. Well, it is going to stumble and offend him. If I am strong in the faith and eating prime rib doesn't bother me spiritually, then I need to bear the infirmities of the weak. I need to put up with, with him and not, five, not live for my own pleasure. So that's that's the interpretation of the of the that ver that verse and then we go on to it says so rather than willing to please myself I should live to please others as a Christian many times we are called upon to live by the standards is that not working? by the standard by the standards that other men have set but walking in love not living to please myself but living actually to please others, walking more rigid than I would if I was just following my own convictions, Paul gives us it, then the example of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and then we go on to Christ, our example, did not come to please himself, but he, when he came, he said, I do always those things that please the Father, for I am not to do my to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. A good rule is to live to please God, not to live to please myself. Living to please yourself can create a stumbling block for weaker brothers so in, so in love because it would please God, be gracious. So we're supposed to be very gracious to people that are, are weaker. And what it means by uh, us being strong, one being stronger, the other one weaker, is that we're stronger in the word and the weaker, the weaker people are not as strong in the word. So that's what that means. It doesn't mean that they're sick or they're, you know, they're, uh, they're hurt or they're handicapped. It's, they're just the weaker because they have, they have not had the, um, what is it? The, the, they haven't matured as we have. So that, that's what that means. <coughs> 
then um, let's go into, I'm now going to go to 15-4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. So now he brings in hope. For our learning, the Bible was given to us to reveal God. For our learning about God, our understanding of God, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. God and hope are connected together. There is no real hope apart from God. Amazing how that when you have God, hope is extended and hope is expanded. And this, uh, he is our, Jesus is our hope, God is our hope. All the way through the hope of the believer is connected with God. So now God has given us the scripture to understand his nature, his character, his faithfulness, so, so that we in the time in time in the time of trouble will not despair. We will not give up, but we will continue to hope in that work of God and in that work of God's victory within our lives. That position of despair and hopelessness is not one that Chris, that Christian should find in, a Christian should find himself in. Like the psalmist found himself cast down, but he talked to himself about it and said. Why are you cast down? Why are you depressed? Oh, my soul, why are you upset? Why are you dis disquieted within me? The reason was why, why was because he forgot for a while that God was on the throne. When he, we forget that God is on the throne and ruling over our lives, it is possible that we can get discouraged and upset over situations. So when something happens, like, I have love to, share with you is that I've had a really hard week this week. It's been, it's just been one thing after another. And um, at first I was kind of getting discouraged and I don't know. It has to do with me teaching tonight and also it has to do with, you know, not everything is wonderful. And it's been a wonderful couple, like a wonderful month that, you know, with my granddaughter here and everything and us getting her settled and everything. Then all of a sudden things break loose and it's like what happened here and then i realized oh i'm teaching on wednesday so i had a little bit of doubt in myself and all the way till tonight i doubted myself so i just wanted to let you know that it's been a tough week <laughs> but i'm doing okay now i have the joy of the lord and i have hope that's that's where it comes from you know that i have to center myself towards him he is my center. He is my focus. I am not. You know, when I go into myself, then it gets all messed up. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Amen. reminding me who you are. Yes. <clears throat> Just said this about that. So. It is interesting how quickly we can forget that God reigns, how quickly we forget that it is his church. Suddenly we get all worried and get all concerned and we wonder, what are we doing? What are we going to do? Over and over, the Lord reminds us that it, it is his church. So we're not to worry about anything because he's got it all under control anyway. And because it is his church, we have no business worrying about it. He can take care of it. He has created it. It, and, his, and he is able to maintain it. Yeah. And we don't have to lie awake at night wondering, oh, what are we going to do now? Or what are we going to do next? Because he has full control. God is in control. We need to realize that God is in control, that God is doing, going, to do, going to work, not to get upset, not to get discouraged, not to be in turmoil, for the Lord reigns and he shall Bring to pass his work. If we if we just patiently wait for him, after that, and that is the problem, isn't it? That that thing called patience. We aren't very patient. We want it now or instant gratification. Give it to me now. <coughs> there is that time where we have to then, by faith, patiently now wait for God to do His work. Now there is where now 
Now there is where we are tempted to meddle and mess things up because we don't wait for God. So we're not waiting. When we get impatient, we don't wait for God. And uh, I go on to, let me get into, okay, so we have to read verse 15, 5. I mean, verse 5. 15, 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encourage, encouragement grant you to be the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. God is patient. He's, the, he's so patient. And another word for it is long-suffering. He is so patient to bring past his purposes. That is because God is outside of our dimension. God lives in the, in the eternal. We look at it, God lives in eons. We, are, we always live in months, days, years, seconds, minutes. God lives in eons, eternity. And a thousand years is as a day of to the Lord, a day that is as a thousand years, and Lord, it has been so long. When Jesus, come, when is Jesus coming back? It has only been a couple of days. What is our? What is your hurry? Because God is outside of the time dimension, and we move in this dimension of time. It seems that God is so patient in bringing to pass His kingdom, His work upon the earth. So we continue our prayer. Oh God, give us patience right now. <clears throat> How are we to be? We are to be patient with one another, as God is the God of patience and consolation. So we are to be each other, are to be to each other. We are to be comforting to one another, and we are to be patient with one another. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we're to appreciate God's patience with us. However, we are not so patient with him. We are always so patient with others. Now, as you would, um, let me see here. I get back there. Mess them up here. Now, there is an interesting thing. Appreciate God's patience with us. However, we are not so patient with him. We, but we are always, not always so patient with others. Now, as you would, as you would, that men should do unto you, that is the way you should do to them likewise. Comfort, be patient according to Christ Jesus. Okay? I don't know if I make it much sense anymore. Uh, number 15. Uh, 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7. So that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of, your, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. <coughs> now the church, as we minister to each other in the love of Jesus Christ and through the word of God, we, we do glorify God through this life of love consolation, patience with one another, and we are to receive them, them one another. How? As Christ received us. Now, how did Christ receive you? Were you absolutely the ideal perfect person? Did he say, go out and clean your, up your act and then I will accept you? No. He received us with all our imperfections. Isn't it amazing how horrible our sins look when someone else is committing them? How blind we are to our own faults, how astute we are in being able to pick out the flaws of others. But as Jesus said, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see more clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Why is it that we have such a hard time seeing the log in our own eye Yet we can we can see so clearly that the splinter in their eye it, it is a boy it is all a matter of love love conquers a multitude of sins. I won't be seeing and picking at. I won't be seeing and picking at all the little flaws in you but I will then receive you even as Christ has received me. So 
So now it's verse 8. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. In other words, he came to the Jews because God made, had made the promise to the fathers that he would send the Savior unto them, the seed of David, the seed of Abraham. He came to minister unto those whom God had made the promise. And nine, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and I will sing to your name, 2 Samuel 22, 50. And then again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people in Deuteronomy 32, 43. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah, and that's Psalm 117, 1. And again, Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles go. So that, that all through the Old Testament, they were talking about Jesus. It was pointing to Jesus. makes a statement and then he begins to back it up with scripture. When you can back up your statements with scriptures, three or four references, for in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Paul's, Paul had vast working knowledge of the Old Testament. So he, he was introducing the fact that Christ came directly to the Jews, and yet the prophecy expanded beyond the Jews to the ministry to the Gentiles. He came to confirm the promises to the fathers, which he did, but then that the Gentiles might glorify God through the mercies that they received as it is written. <coughs> 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it is the, hope, the subject of hope which comes from the scriptures, the God of all hope, hope is one of the most important things. We must not lose hope in God. He is the God of all hope. May he fill you. May he fill you. The result of hope is joy and peace. Why thou art, again, I that repeated, why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted? You see, he is talking about oppression and unrest. The opposite of that is joy and peace. The result of the hope that we have is joy and peace in believing. In believing what? The scripture God of God, the word of God. Our belief is based upon the fact that God said it. The result of that belief is joy and peace. <clears throat> There's a little story in here that talks about, you know, we can, how we can let go of our joy and peace, and our, we go into our feelings, and that's what we're not supposed to do, is to, um, you know, to believe that it's, it, God is in control, that He is on the throne. So uh, there's a story that says here, you knew you shouldn't have gone to Bob's after the service and had onion on the hamburger. Now you are soft, suffering for it, and you are irritable, and you're upset. So it's a physical feeling. It's not, you know, you're not relying on God. It's your your physical or your your body is not is not correct. You see, the faith is not in the feeling. It is not believing in a feeling. It is believing the word of God, what God has said. And so my faith is founded in the fact that God's word, it doesn't change. Feelings do. My feelings are changeable. So our feelings are changeable, but God is not. And he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So he never changes. So that's why it's good to know the word of God, because he never changes. It never changes. <coughs> feelings can change. They can be altered. The word of God is forever established. Just what I said. And because my salvation relationship with God 
is predicated upon his sure word. My relationship with God never changes. It is established, and so it is the believing that has brought me the peace and joy. Um, it goes into, and Paul said that after 14 days tossed in the ship, be of good cheer. For this night, the angel of the Lord stood by me, and he assured me that though his, the ship is destroyed, there will not be the loss of life. Which he, that, that was true. I believe the word of the Lord is what he said. Paul was cheerful. He was happy. He was encouraging them to be cheerful when they had lost all hope over being saved, ever be, of ever being saved. They had given up hope for ever being rescued, uh, of ever coming out uh, of this alive, and to have a guy getting up and whistling and smiling. They probably wanted to have them walk the plank. Be of good cheer. Are you kidding? Man, I am so seasick. 14 days bobbing like a like a fork in, on the Mediterranean. Haven't seen the sun and, and the stars. He didn't say, be of good cheer. I feel good today. I have peace in my heart. No, I have the word of the Lord and I believe the word of the Lord. So the faith is established and it is solid and it is secure because it is established in the word and in the scriptures. <clears throat> be careful of that. It is an easy it is an easy trap to fall into where people get faith in their feelings. And it is interesting we have to express so often by feelings and experience that we have. We use our feelings to pr express the experience, but in expressing our experience of, say, salvation, oh, I had such peace. I never felt such peace in all my life. Oh, I felt like there was just warm water poured over the top of my head and just down over me whole, my whole body. And I just felt this great warmth all over me. As we are experiencing, expressing our experiences, then people get in their mind, well, I've got to have that kind of experience or I'm not saved. <clears throat> because when we have, was, because when he was saved, it was like lights turning on, strobe lights flashing in glory, and I haven't seen the strobes yet, so I can't be saved. Because we describe our salvation by the experiences of feeling, or whatever we have, people began to relate to the feelings rather than to the word of God. You cannot do that. I am saved because God's word declares that if you shall confess with him that your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God was raised, was raised from him from the dead, and thou and the, and you shall be saved. I know I am saved because here's where God said it. I can point right to it, and thus it doesn't waver. It doesn't change. It doesn't alter my, with my feelings. Concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you're, you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. <clears throat> but I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God, <clears throat> to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest of the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting things pertaining to God. Um, when I read this years ago, that this, uh, this particular verse about boasting, and it really, it, it really convicted me because I, I knew I, I can't boast about myself. I can boast about other people, but we're supposed to glorify and boast about God and what he's done for us. And so <clears throat> this has been a, a special uh, scripture for me. Uh, so going back to 14. I have confident, brethren, that you are capable of doing this, full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to capable of admonishing one another. Now I know that you can admonish each other and yet you have all knowledge and yet 
because of the grace God has given to me, am writing boldly now these things to you. <coughs> Paul writing to the Gentiles is declaring unto them that they are accepted by God. The offering of, of the Gentiles, that would be the offering of their praises and worship unto God. Because of the work the Holy Spirit is accepted to God, you don't need to don't need the priesthood, you don't need the washings and the cleansings of the law, but God accepts you because of the work of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that is given to us. <clears throat> Paul the Apostle had a very powerful ministry among the Gentiles. <clears throat> it was more than just the ministry of the Word, it was the Word confirmed by the work of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Mark, the last verse it says, they went everywhere, preaching the word, the Holy Spirit working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Paul, when he wrote the, to the Corinthians, said, My speech was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but with, but with the demonstration and the power of the Spirit. Paul, in the beginning of the epistle to the Romans, declared that he desired to come to them, that he might impart unto them some spiritual gift, to the end that they both might be built up. Paul's ministry was in word and in word. <laughs> the word of God is wonderful. It is important. It is powerful. It is alive, sharper than, than a two-edged sword, but it has to also work in our lives and be demonstrated through our lives. Many times what I say what I say is totally lost on the ears of the hearers because of what I am. If the word doesn't work in my life and I cannot demonstrate the power of the word of God through my life, then all the principles in the world, if they are not practical, don't work no matter how good a principle they may be. They are of no value. If it, if it, is, if it is the Holy Spirit that takes the word, no, I'm sorry. It is the Holy Spirit that takes the word and then makes the word operable in my life and deeds that are demonstrated. That of love, that of power, and the Holy Spirit can manifest himself in many ways. And there's a, a John 4, 14, 9 through 11. Um, Philip approached the, uh, Jesus and he said, Lord, just show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said, have I been so long a time with you, Philip? You haven't, you have, you have, haven't you seen me? He that has, has seen me has seen the Father. How is it that you are saying, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the works that I do, I don't do my, to my, of myself, but the Father dwells in me he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe for the very works' sake. John 14, 9 through 11. Jesus spoke of how his works testified of him. And so our lives are witnesses of that work of God, his Holy Spirit in us. Our lives are a greater witness than our words. We have always thought of our words as witnesses and we always thought as witnessing in a verbal sense. Verbalizing my faith to someone else, verbalizing their need for Jesus Christ, but a greater witness than your words are your works wrought through the Holy Spirit in love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye love one another. So it is important that our deeds match the glorious gospel that we proclaim through the word. So um, verse 18, 19, and 20. For I will not presume to speak of anything except that Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and thus I aspired to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. 
So there, there's where you're going to places where they haven't heard. But they'll hear, they'll understand when you speak of Jesus Christ. And so, for this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way thereby, thereby you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. <coughs> for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So um, he not only would preach, but I really think that he also asked for, for help for Jerusalem because they were in a weak state. Apparently, you know, when they first, you know, Pentecost, when they, they first came together, they received the Holy Spirit, and they sold everything and they put everything together. Well, apparently, it looks like that maybe they were uh, poor now. They hadn't retrieved any of their, their belongings or any, anything like that, so <clears throat> he wanted to go back and, and give them a gift. And so all of the people that he, had, he, had, he was with, or visiting, they gave him money and he would be wanted to bring that gift to Jerusalem. Uh, so 27 says, yes, they were pleased to do so and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to, indebted <coughs> to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on the fruit of theirs, I will go on my way of you to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. <laughs> well, he did get back to Jerusalem, but they, they banned against him and tried to kill him. So, um, you know, he wanted to preach before, and, and God told him, "Get out! You're not going to, you're not going to preach in, in Jerusalem. You're going to go preach. You're going to um, preach to the Gentiles." So, when he went back, they did try and, and kill him. That's when he was taken into. I'm right now, I'm reading Acts, so he was uh, with, right, uh, what was the first one? That was Festus was after, where the, he, you know, he was in prison, and, and you know, he got himself out of being, being killed because he was, he was a Roman citizen. And so the, um, the, whoever, the commander that was in charge said, said okay, we're not gonna touch this one, and then they brought him to the, to the, uh, the uh, I don't know, it's a premier or whatever, the guy, the one in control, in, in, in charge. Um, and asked, let me check that one. I just got it. That's when he was presented to Felix, and then Paul is now going to go to Festus, and I guess apparently he was several years in Rome or in wherever that. Festus was and, and Felix, and he was given freedom to to, to live in the, in the court area or wherever. He was more free than most prisoners, but he still couldn't leave. So I don't know what happened to him after that. I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> but um, I just went, I, I'm pretty much finished giving my lesson. Uh, Let me read this part right here. Now, Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this. He had gone to Corinth and to the churches in Macedonia to collect an offering to take to the poor saints in Jerusalem to help them in their need. He had written to the church of Corinth to take up collection before I get there. I don't want offering any offerings taken while I am there, but each man, as he has purposed in his own heart, so let me give, let him give. 
but I want to take it to the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem had experienced some real financial problems. Probably this is what I was telling you about. Probably stemming from that early communal sharing where everyone sold their possessions and brought the money and laid it at the disciples' feet. And in time, it ran out, so they were left without property and all they had sold, that had sold. So they were in a sad state in Jerusalem, and Paul was seeking to take them help. So, you know, it, again, we will love one another no matter what. <coughs> they rejected him. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. Hmm. This was a good thing that they did. So they have, they have, they have benefited spiritually, and so it is only proper that they minister to the carnal needs or the fleshly needs, fleshly or the body needs. The fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ, I know when I come, that is the way I am going to come. Why? Because that is the way Paul went everywhere. Just in the fullness, he his life overflowed. Paul here is requesting that they join with him in his prayers for himself. I think that one of the great, great, great blessings and a sort of pyramid, it has a pyramidal, pyramidal effect that the more your ministry influences more people, the more people that you have praying for you. The more people you have praying for you, the more effective and broader is the base of your ministry. <coughs> but Paul here is asking now for prayers of the people. Join me in my prayers for me, Paul is saying, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, that they that my services which have I have for Jerusalem may be accepted by the saints. Paul wasn't on the best of terms with those in Jerusalem, not because he didn't want to be, but they were just uh, always suspicious of him. It seemed that wherever Paul went, there was a there was trouble with the Jews, and for him to go right back to Jerusalem when he came back. They said, now Paul, the rumor is going around about your preaching among the, the Gentiles. Look, behave yourself while you are here. Don't create problems now. <coughs> here is a couple of guys that they, and they need to take their vows so they can observe the feast. And why don't you sponsor them and just show everybody that you are a good Jew? Be good, Paul. And so Paul was trying to be good and the Jews caught him anyhow and were going to kill them, but they were concerned whenever Paul would come around because he was so straightforward. In other words, he was shot right to the, you know, he told you exactly the truth. He was there was no, no pretty fluff around it. Um, he wasn't always that welcomed even within the church, so he's going to take them some money, so pray that they will accept the money and me. <coughs> so I, that pretty much ends that one and it says in, in verse 33 this is it now the God of peace be with you all amen amen <laughs> Chapter 15, Romans. That's going to conclude uh, the letter, the epistle to the Romans. And Sister Sue, we have an anchor for that. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, 
very announcement for tonight. Other than the regular announcements, okay? Oh, yeah, Sister Sue won't get the on, on Tuesdays from 3 to 5. So the time is 11 to 2 now. All right. On the uh, community feeding on Tuesdays, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., right? Yep. Okay. So Sister Sue is requesting water for her, uh, for the services. Yeah, and cases of water. And in fact, anything else you can donate would be appreciated as well. You can see Sister Sue for that. And Sister uh, Felicia, Felicia. Felicia um, I'm wondering if the seventh would be enough time, not as soon as I can donate whatever amount of water you need. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not real clear. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking if the seventh of the coming month will be too late at that time I can oh, no, donate anytime, whatever needed. Any time is good. It doesn't any time? Yeah, because oh, okay. we have uh, we have a supply of water, but it, okay. it runs out okay. really quickly. <coughs> okay, and, and speaking of donation, oh sorry. No, okay. Uh, we have a bake sale on Sunday. A bake sale from what time? After church on Sunday. Oh after church on Sunday. Okay. A big sale after church on Sunday, sorry. Okay. Uh, that was spiritual donations. If you can remember, and if you can, the church is always in need of big goods. Uh, to the clinics, uh, toiletry items, uh, paper towels, paper and towel, so forth. Toilet paper, water. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. All right. The table outside of the well, library. I just can't see it. Drop it on the table. Bring it on the table. We appreciate it. And uh, are there any announcements for you, Sister Sandy? Okay, so we have the record announcements. Uh, Sunday service, we know Sunday schools at 9 30, 10 30, uh, the regular service, uh, Tuesdays, uh, community feeding, which, we, uh, which has been changed from 11 to 2 p.m. on Wednesdays to 6 p.m. in Bible study and general uh, uh, meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, Fridays, the next Zoom meeting for the uh, ladies' Bible study will be October the 14th. That's right, 6.30 p.m. Zoom. Okay, and that's it for the announcements. Sister. This coming Saturday? Right, with the women's. It's first Saturday. Yes, this is this Saturday. Is it on the gene date or? Oh, you guys have to ask, like, the lady said it was happening. Yeah, this is about to announce it on Sunday. Yes. Okay. It's going to be a problem. 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. It's going to be 11 o'clock. Women's Fellowship will be October, uh, October 2nd, right? Yeah. It will be on Pablo. So October 1st is Saturday. Okay, it's going to be on the 1st. It will be a potluck at 11. We got it. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, one more announcement. Don't forget Sunday, October 9th, we're celebrating Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sunday, October 9th. October 9th. Sunday, yes. celebrating pastors and anniversary. 25th birthday. No, no, no. 25th anniversary. He said 25th birthday. Ladies birthday. God, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for this afternoon, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for letting us receive the Holy Spirit once we believed in the gospel. And thank you, Lord, for allowing that Holy Spirit to be our daily teacher and our guide 
in Jesus' name. Amen.